I just started it. Thank you. Thanks for that All reminder. Right. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It didn't pop up on mine. Oh, I guess I have a button there. I didn't see it. All right. So uh, welcome to the 10th and last webinar in our IGNIS series for this season. Uh, we'll be done for the season after this one, and we'll start back up again next winter, and we'll keep you guys all informed of when that date will be and what kind of great presentations we have lined up for you. IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do today, to ignite your curiosity about our Washington faculty learning community, communities. And this series is brought to you by SBCTC eLearning and HEL. My name is Alyssa Sells, and I'm the SBCTC eLearning Program Administrator. And Jennifer Wetham is my counterpart, and she is the SBCTC Program Administrator for Faculty Development. We're kind of two parts of the same coin. And um, you may have heard of us referred to as the Dynamic Duo or the Wonder Twins. We're planning on getting t-shirts made. So sometime you'll see us wearing our twin shirts. What's our new thing? It says Wonder Twins on the front and then on the back, like excessive Excess genius. Excessive genius, yes. So <laughs> when you see us, you'll know who we are. All right. Also joining us this afternoon is our fabulous collaborate rep, Amber Guler. And she has been so gracious to agree to help us moderate these sessions and to show up and make sure that we um, don't have any huge technical problems and make fools of ourselves. So thank you, Amber, for joining us today. We're so excited to offer this webinar series to you all, and we have a great lineup of presenters for you today, and Jennifer will be introducing them shortly. I'd also like to take just a second to thank our presenters for sharing their experience and their knowledge with us today, and also a big shout out to all of our participants who are attending the session live and to anyone who goes back and watches this recording at a later date. On that note, uh, let me paste a link into the chat for you here. You can do it here. Th this link is um, the link to the ATL blog that Jennifer does a great job keeping up to date. And um, that's the link that goes directly to uh, the IGNIS recordings. And you can um, go there and watch this after the fact or review if you want to. Um, Barb, could I have you turn off your talk button for me, please? Thank you. All right, um, moving along, let's see what else we've got coming up here. All right, so anyone that wants to use audio today, please feel free to go ahead and test that using the tools menu at the top um, left side of your screen. And there's a drop down there, and you're just going to click on the audio setup wizard and then on test your audio, and it will run you through. Um, a little series of tests to see if your microphone is working. Also check to make sure that your headset is not muted because um, we won't be able to hear you. And then um, if you want to see if it's working, uh, you can click on the talk button. We'll talk about the talk button in just a second, um, but you can click it. And if a little blue microphone uh, shows next to your name, that means your microphone is on. All right, let's go to our next slide. OK, so here is just a quick, quick overview of our meeting interface. We're using the whiteboard right now. That's where you see our slides. And then um, right between the whiteboard and uh, the left-hand panel that I'll explain in a second, there's a little skinny little toolbar. And those are the whiteboard tools. We'll use those in just a second. So make sure you note where those are. The upper left corner is the audio video pane, and that's where you see a picture of me. Um, I'm actually doubled right now because I'm actually in the upper left pane, and I'm also on this slide. Jen says I'm famous because she's been using this uh, screenshot for lots of stuff that she does. All right, in the middle there is the participants panel. That's where you can see a list of names of everyone who's joining us today. And then on the bottom left is our chat window, and we'll get to that in just one sec. All right, so as a participant, you have access to some tools. And we are going to use some of these tools today. So we have emoticons. You can give a smiley face. I'll add one right there. You can see it right underneath my name. My name's always at the top because it starts with an A, so I'm always usually first on the list. If you need to step away, you can click the step away button to show us that you're um, stepped away from the webinar for just one second. You can raise your hand if you would like to speak, and we will call on you. And then there's a polling tool here, which right now is set to yes, no with that little check mark. But I'm actually 
going to take this one second here and change the polling type because we are going to do a poll here in just one second and I always forget to do it before we start. You'll see that the check mark has changed to an A now. The little blue microphone indicates that the um, that your mic is on, so if you're speaking, you'll have that on, and go ahead and turn it off when you're not speaking, please. Okay, our chat window's in the lower left. We are running on um, a loose Ignite format today where we're giving our presenters about 10 minutes each to get through their presentations. We are going to hold questions till the end, but if you have um, a great question or a super brilliant thought during the session or something you'd like to share, please go ahead and put that into the chat box and we will come back and um, review all of those inspirational comments as soon as our speakers are done speaking and we get to our Q&A session. All right, so I mentioned we were going to use the whiteboard tools. So if you could locate your uh, toolbar for the whiteboard, it's that skinny little toolbar right in the center there. And if you'll hover over the sun icon and hold and point, you can select an icon to use as your pointer tool. And feel free to practice on this slide if you'd like. We're actually going to use this on uh, the very, very next slide. I'm going to pick the smiley face and I'll put one on here for you so you can see what I'm talking about. Looks like somebody grabbed a green check. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and move on. We are going to use this tool on the next slide. Thank you very much. Great participation. Lovely. Okay, so uh, this is just a fun little thing. Jen and I like to ask um, where you all are located. I am in Everett in Snohomish County today, so I'm going to um, plop myself right there with my smiley face. I see lots of people putting themselves on the map. Oh, we have somebody outside of Washington maybe. All right, keep on tracking there. Give us some more pointers. Let us know where you're at. Okay. All right, going to move on to our next activity. We are going to use the polling tool that I showed you just a minute ago. And um, we like to know who you are, not only where you are, but who you are. Are you full-time faculty, part-time faculty, administrator, staff? Uh, do you fall into an other category, uh, like a CBO partner or something else that we didn't think to put on here? Go ahead and find that on um, the participants panel and respond to the poll. I am going to pick C because I'm an administrator, and then you can see that the um, letter that you chose is right next to your name, and I'm going to go ahead and publish those results to our window here so everybody can see. Okay, and um, it looks like it didn't grab all the results. looks like some of them got re erased before um, I got them published, but um, normally we would see everybody's responses there, and I know some are missing because I clicked on C and it's not showing here. All right, so um, now, just a little bit of meeting etiquette. Uh, we do ask that you raise your hand when you'd like to speak, and then we'll call on you in numerical order so that we can get to you in a timely fashion. Again, uh, the talk button, click that if you're going to speak, or if you want to put your questions into chat, go ahead and do that. That's, that's fine. Um, do remember to turn that talk button off, though, when you're done speaking, because we can hear the background. We can hear you typing. We can hear your kitty snoring, which is what happens at my house. My cat sits on a chair behind me, and she snores sometimes. Okay, use those emoticons to tell us um, if you're indicating approval or a job well done. And um, remember to put all those inspirational comments into the chat. And I am going to turn this over to Jen right now, who is going to talk for just one second about faculty learning communities. And then um, she'll introduce our speakers, and we'll get going for the day. I hope Go everyone ahead. can see my LOL emoticon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever talked for one second in my life. Um, so welcome, and thank you again for joining us. And I just wanted to talk for a few seconds about what a faculty learning community is. We use a, a loose, um, we're inspired loosely by the Miami model. And faculty from all different dis disciplines, um, or sometimes from the same discipline, get together and engage in an active year-long program that is really designed to foster their professional learning. And it can, of course, involve students and staff as well, because we all know it takes a village. There's, uh, there's lots of different things an FLC might do. 
um, they might work on a specific course, they might work on a program, they might work on um, a specific aspect of teaching, they might go to retreats, they might organize, they might participate in seminars. There's um, there's a lot that you can do in an FLC, and the kind of nice thing is that we get to see a lot today about what different FLCs do with their time and their interests. We love these because they increase faculty interest in teaching and learning, and that they and what I really like about them is that they provide safety for faculty and support to take risks to try out something new. Um, it's it's just very nice to uh, give a safe space to cultivate innovation. A cohort-based FLC um, might be a group of adjunct faculty. It might be a group of discipline-specific faculty. Um, th that's a cohort-based FLC. Or a topic-based FLC might look at a specific topic and might draw from all over the campus. Um, we have a few other, um, inform sorry, I'm just moving through those slides too early. So we're going to start now with um, Lower Columbia because one of their faculty members has to go and teach. So I, um, I'm going to share my desktop now. And I'm going to call up their Prezi, and we will, and where did it go? <laughs> Excuse me for one second while I, there it is. OK. All right. So I'm just wondering if you guys can see this screen now. Uh, Jen, I see Google, but I haven't seen the Prezi load yet. You want to refresh? I do. Yes, I do. There we go. Yay. You got it? Thank you. Well, it's yeah. starting to come. It's not all the way there yet. OK. Um, Joan Herman and um, Amber Lemure and Stephanie. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to see everyone's names here. Um, but Neil. Stephanie and Neil are going to present um, on their uh, faculty learning community from Lower Columbia on collaborative learning. Hey, Jen, I'm still only just seeing it barely loaded. I know we oh. tried it beforehand and it loaded fine. There it goes. OK. No? Oh, no. going back to Google. Did you refresh again? Yeah, I'm going to try one. I'm trying something okay. else this time. OK, there we go. Stop, 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 stop <laughs> fixing <Yeah>. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies, go ahead. Whenever you're ready. Make sure you click on your talk button so that we can hear you. Oh, OK, there it is. It looks like they might have a mic delay, Jen. Oh, OK. I'm not sure. Um, I, oh, it looks we go. like their mic is off. Yeah, there we go. it does. Yeah, there we go, OK. Ladies, click your talk button or run your audio wizard, please. This was working just a few minutes ago when we tested. There you go. Yay. <laughs> so can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. Wonderful. We're Yay. <laughs> OK, well, thank you very, very much for that introduction. My name is Stephanie Neal, and I'm going to be starting us out today. Hello. Me and Joan and Amber are going to be presenting information on our faculty learning community, which focused on collaborative learning. And many of you may be saying, why collaborative learning? Why is that our focus? Well, we found that many faculty have heard of collaborative learning. They may know what it is. But oftentimes, they lack the ability to implement techniques in their classroom, or they don't feel that they have the resources to implement the activities in their classroom. And we saw a need for this. And if Jennifer, if you would switch slides for me. I'm sure many of you have seen this in your classroom in some form or another. Students that look disinterested, they've disconnected, they, they don't have any 
engagement for what they're learning. And it really, that lack of connection to the content doesn't make for a very effective environment. And we wanted to try and, and do something different. We wanted to get away from the boring lectures where the instructor talks for a prolonged period of time and you see the student's eyes start to glaze over and they've completely disassociated. If you would switch the slide for me again. Oftentimes, I think our students, when we're talking for a prolonged period of time, just hear wah, 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 just like Charlie Brown. And we really, we, we don't want that. We want the collaborative environment. We feel that students need to be active participants in their education in order to be successful. Learning not only from the instructor, but learning from each other is really so important. And so our faculty also wanted to share ideas and learn from other faculty members around campus, too, which is really the inspiration for our faculty learning community. And I'm going to pass it over to Joan Herman, and she's going to tell you our inspiration for our FLC. Hi, I'm Joan, and you can switch slides. Thank you, Jennifer. You read my mind. I teach English here, and I'm also the faculty professional development coordinator. And a year ago, a little over a year ago, a large group of us from Lower Columbia went to the Achieving the Dream Conference, the National Conference in Dallas, Texas. And we are an Achieving the Dream School, as I know many other Washington community colleges are. And one of our members, one of our faculty members, Brad Benjamin, whom you will see at the very end of this slideshow, happened to attend a workshop put on by a group of faculty from Patrick Henry Community College. And they have an institute, they've developed it called SCALE, and that acronym stands for the Southern Center for Active Learning Excellence. And Brad was really impressed, um, sold uh, to our administration, bringing the team from SCALE, it was a four-member faculty team, I believe, to our campus this last fall to put on a two-day in-service for our faculty. And I think you can switch slides now, Jennifer. I don't remember exactly. Um, and you can imagine, actually I got ahead of myself, but no worries, just leave it there. You can imagine the reception of our faculty on hearing just a few days before they are um, set to start a new academic year with new classes, new students, everything, uh, that they had to be in two full days of in-service. Yes, well, we, they thought they were going to hear wah, 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 as let's face it, we often do for in-service days, trainings that some of us, frankly, don't feel are very useful for us and waste our time. Well, guess what? We didn't get any of that. Even the naysayers, by the end of the presentation, were, well, maybe they weren't raving, but the fact that they were saying things like, that wasn't bad, was indication to us that the workshops were indeed very successful. And we had a number of excellent comments from faculty as a result of um, the trainings. And we sent out a survey afterwards and unsolicited, well, I guess it was solicited since we did send out a survey. But we received a lot of comments, which you can see here. And the font is a little too small for my eyes to read, but I, I can paraphrase them. Um, some of our longtime faculty members who sat through a lot of, let's face it, bad in-service trainings thought this one was excellent, the best they'd ever seen. Um, other comments you know, had to do with getting great ideas that they could run with from day one. So we, we were really gratified to hear this. And, and all of us um, who participated, I myself really enjoyed it and got a lot of great ideas. Well, as a result of the training, I decided to set up a faculty learning community just on collaborative learning to extend what we had learned in the two-day in-service. And so I did just that, received the grant from the state board, and put out a call for volunteers of folks who'd like to participate in the community. And I received about a dozen requests. And we had a great group this year of, of faculty. And you can go ahead and uh, move to the next slide. Thanks. I forgot to tell you that. Uh, we had a great group of faculty, about a dozen of us from across the dip disciplines, nursing, biology, English, library. Um, ABE, ESL, all working together. And we would share ideas, bring them in, um, show various uh, videos, TED Talks, TED Talks, et cetera, 
and we created a Canvas page of all of our work, kind of a, um, a blackboard, you could say. And you can transition again one more time. Next slide, please. And we were meeting biweekly um, to share our strategies, our ideas, our success stories, perhaps things that needed a bit of work. Some of our members provided professional development workshops. Um, and as I mentioned, we also set up the Canvas page of resources. Next slide, please. So what we'd like to do in the future is obviously to continue the work. And we're hoping, actually, I think we are going to bring back the scale trainers again next fall, just to repeat the same workshop. For those who've already taken it, it will be a great refresher. Um, but we'll have a number of new faculty on board. And we also hope to encourage a number of adjunct faculty who didn't attend last year to a train as well. We'd like to try to also create some webinar trainings, kind of like this one, so that faculty can watch it when they have time to watch it and don't have to try to fit a face-to-face -face workshop into their schedule. Next slide. Well, and this is our, our fearless instigator, Brad, um, who got the idea after attending a workshop at the Achieving the Dream conference. And I'm really glad he did, because it's been an enriching experience for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. I'm, I'm really glad that he had a good experience, too. And I'm really glad that you took the initiative to take something that was really exciting and try to sustain it and develop it. And um, I'm sure that if you want to do some webinars, that Amber would be more than happy to help you. I, I just totally volunteered Amber. <laughs> Well, and Amber was just hired as a full-time faculty member, so I'm sure she, you can uh, always recruit her to do that. I shouldn't volunteer her for anything, but, but she uh, loves anything like this. So she'll, I'm sure, be on top of it. And she's going to be applying for a grant for a different FLC. Anyway. Yeah, we have two Ambers. So I oh, think, I'm sorry. I think Jen met our, our fabulous collaborate rep. Oh, thank Amber. you. And we've had a great, <laughs> no, that's we've okay. a great Amber here, Let too. everyone know which Amber we're talking about. Yes, both Ambers are fabulous. And I do, I like to volunteer both Ambers for a lot of things. <laughs> um, so I am going to turn it over now. Oh, Sorry, Earl, Earl has his hand up. Yes, Earl. Oh, never mind. I had application sharing sputtering, but it just opened up. Thank you. Oh. Oh, OK. Yeah, sorry. I That was my bad. <laughs> so um, I think we're ready to hear from, um, about, from Pierce College about their interdisciplinary collaborations between professional and technical programs. Um, so Kathy and Terry, take it away. OK. Hi, I'm, I'm Terry. And uh, I'm Terry Morand. And with me is my colleague, Kathy Bassett, who you can see in the little photo. Can you talk for a second, Kathy? Hello. So that, she, that she shows up. As you can see, she has with her a friend who you're going to meet a little I'm bit later. Buddy. OK. Um, it appears that we've had a faculty learning community which focused on bringing together professional and technical program faculty to explore where and how their programs might collaborate in order to enhance student learning. I would like to start by defining the lens through which I view this lear learning community. I personally am an academic transfer person from Spanish and French to, that I transplanted to professional technical. So that was kind of an adventure. <laughs> Uh-oh. I lost my slides. There they go. OK. Um, so. The inspiration from this for this project came from um, Kathy and Kathy's and my uh, earlier collaborations. She provided bloodboard pathogens training, and I have provided interpreter services for um, dental hygiene. Kathy's um, Kathy's field. Uh, the group included representatives from dental hygiene, or strong showing, I think. Um, there were three people from mental hygiene, uh, from veterinary technology, criminal justice, homeland security, emergency management, diagnostic health and fitness, nursing, 
my program, which is language interpreting, and one person from the University of Puget Sound Physical Therapy program. Uh, the first lesson was that getting a group of professional technical faculty together is like herding cats. Um, everyone's very busy, not only with teaching, but with heavy advising loads, with advisory committees, and then maintaining uh, industry standards and meeting their requirements. The first meeting, even with the promise of food, was not only difficult to set up, but also very poorly attended. Not only that, one of the few people that showed up was completely confused about what we were doing and never came back. Um, personally, I'm used to discussing things as a scholar, as a teacher, as a person. Even my professional technical field, interpreting, is about talking. I was in for a big surprise with this group. The rest of them were not. To quote my dear colleague Teresa in Criminal Justice, we're pro-tech. We like to do things. Hands-on activities are what motivates this group. Skip the theory, we want practice. When we finally managed to get together, the energy was amazing. Everyone was talking to everyone with great enthusiasm and fabulous ideas and really wanted to work with each other and even all together. It turns out that there are recent requirements for health professions to do interdisciplinary training. Yes, Virginia, we work as part of a team in the real world. My field, interpreting, is by its very nature a team effort, and it's a natural fit. So due part to these requirements for interdisciplinary training um, and some other factors, we learned that several of us are already involved in collaborations before we even put this group together. Um, for example, the dental hygiene students have had an ongoing project where we pa match them up with the fitness training students, and they come over and observe them in the clinic, do an ergonomic assessment, and then they bring them over and set them up with an individualized core fitness training program that supports them in their work environment, which is really cool. So the constellations of collaboration emerged, and we found pot potential connections that we want to continue to develop. And fortunately, there was enough room for otherwise, um, for everyone. Otherwise, we'd probably be really, you know, bumping into each other and trying to kind of vie for position on what we're going to do. One of the examples um, is something that I've had my eye on personally for a long time, so this just absolutely opened the door for me, is I have my eye on the nursing program's SimMan. So one of the collaborations that's in the process is we are going to bring the portable dental equipment over and put a sim man in a dental chair. My students will go through a scenario where we're going to um, mimic an adverse event during the process of administering anesthetic drugs. The EMTs will be called in and they will come in and take over the situation, the EMT students. Then they will have to transport them out in the hall, of course, and back into the nursing students and then practice the process of how do you hand off an emergency in a hospital setting when, when they arrive and all the transport and then they will transport them and put them into the, um, the hospital simulation that's set up in our nursing program. Um, also, you know, looking at um, you know, issues of, of transfer, so there's other ergonomic pieces that work along in each of those processes, getting these people along their way. The next thing that happened for us is another collaboration that's bringing a service dog trainer to campus. And it stemmed from an event that happened in the dental clinic. And I had one that had to do with interactions that were very awkward with the handler and the human. And then another, when an animal, the human was having a problem, the animal was giving their signal, but the animal got very upset. And we kind of had a dangerous situation with an unhappy dog in a patient's lap and clinic, which kind of sparked this whole thing of how do we help the people um, that need the service animals, how do we help the service animals be successful, um, how do we have them in our environment, and so this is my Daisy who um, lives with me, and um, we now have six full-size stuffed animals that are geared up in their service dog training gear, and, um, and we have them placed around with the different technical programs, and as they go through a service dog awareness training, they will win a dog for their program that they can create simulations with. Um, I'm lucky enough to live right down the hall from the EMT students at the end of my hall, so we're working with them to set up some collaborations um, between the dental hygiene students, the EMT students, and then 
you know, deal with what do we need to do with the animals. Another example is in the case of an EMT emergency, this animal needs to be in the ambulance with them and they need to know how to deal with that. Um, the other one that was, you know, really, you know, near and dear to us is we got to go on the road and Terry set up a field trip for us and we went over and shared some time with the folks at the physical therapy program at UPS. And, and another, we literally came home with a spreadsheet full of opportunities for different relationships between our physical therapy assisting program and their physical therapy, their occupational therapy, our dental hygiene. Um, and all of us need Terry services with, you know, really understanding what the obligations and needs are for folks who need interpreter services. So that was a really rich um, adventure. The most amazing project is incorporating every program represented into a big campus disaster drill. So now, in preparation, we're candidates for participating as volunteers in disaster drills around the area. Oops, uh-oh, here's where one went out of order, I think. Oh, sorry about that. Is it, um, did we lose it entirely? Um, that's okay, I'll just, I'll just. We'll just do it with that. Okay. Um, there, there was a crying baby. I, I have, I lost my crying baby. Here, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll move it. Just a second. So now, that's my. Okay, there we go. Um, the what didn't work was that my, um, my vision. Uh, included, Kathy and I wrote this grant together, but my vision included a mini curriculum planning retreat at which we would sit around discussing our ideas and sipping wine. This got tossed out early on. In retrospect, how could this group have given up precious hours of class and lab time? I personally, with language interpreting, am hogging all of these projects. Everywhere that people are getting access to services, interpreters have a potential role. Each of these collaborations provides an experience for my students, plus an opportunity to educate future healthcare and other service providers about working with interpreters. The conclusion we can draw from this is that many of us want to provide our students with opportunities to collaborate in a way that best approximates the real workplace they'll encounter, full of different people filling different roles. We would very much like to engage in conversations with anyone involved in this type of collaboration or interested in becoming involved. This type of work doesn't necessarily need to be campus-based, as evidenced by our collaboration with, with University of Puget Sound. So if you can't find a collaborator on your own campus, options still exist for you. One of the things that you know is sort of fascinating is um, this whole process of spillover and as you get excited and talk about this, who wants to be part of it. So just by having these um, these, you know, service dogs living in my office, people will walk down the hall and stop and like, you know, what have you got? Is that a real dog? And be able to tell them about what we're doing. And so just Tuesday, um, I had two folks, the one that deals specifically with our students with disabilities and their service animals on campus, and the other individual who is from HR and deals with any employees in a situation of need um, with their service animal. And so we were able to share what we were doing, and then that led us to the discussion about what we're actually doing on campus as a policy to protect the interests of everybody. And they hadn't realized that because of our dental hygiene clinic, most of our humans and animals coming together are patients from the community and they don't fall under the policy of either of the projects of the campus at large. So that led them to realize we can actually engage literally our um, administration as well as our students and our community and we discovered that we have to actually fix our emergency exits because we had one of our um, handicapped individuals on our committee and project actually get caught where she was outside the door in her cart and her dog was trapped inside and we didn't have the time to get them out. So that brought, you know, the, the team down here to fix the door. That was good. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, it's It's so interesting to hear about 
what happens when you really put people in community with each other, you know, like what sort of things evolve and doors get fixed and we start to reestablish who our audience is. It's, it's very cool. And I love, and thanks for bringing your, um, your fellow presenter, Daisy. <laughs> Thank you, both of you. I really, it's wonderful. So now we have Barb Simmons and Heather, um, Sorry, Heather, I'm, I know your last name, and I'm scrolling down here, and I I don't know if I see you anymore. Did we lose, did we lose Heather? It's Heather Keast, and she's here with, with Barb. Oh, yay. Hi, Heather. There she is, Heather Keast and Barb Simmons. And they are going to talk about their, um, your, uh, their learning community on universal design. Hi, this is Barb starting us off. Uh, these are the top 20 things we learned in our Universal Design for Learning 2 as applied to diversity faculty learning community. And do I advance? Oh, or do um, you? <laughs> you absolutely are welcome to, or okay, I can advance I will, them for I will you. do it if I can. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, got it. There you go. Beautiful. Sometimes learning communities change as they go. Um, last year we had a learning community on universal design for learning and it focused largely on abilities and how to make students with all different types of abilities comfortable in our classrooms and, and give them good access to our classroom materials. The next year we decided to apply that concept, UDL, to identity or diversity. In other words, um, what might there be um, in the life of a homeless person that we need to know about if they're going to feel comfortable and, and succeed in our classroom, whatever the identity might be. However, we quickly learned that we needed to narrow our topic. Diversity was too big. And we narrowed it to race. Um, along the way, um, a large part of, of our activity was actually planning the learning community, and we had to jettison a lot of people with very good ideas. Um, we had an occupational therapist who really wanted to look at um, is the physical environment of the campus uh, welcoming to everyone. And we, someone said, we should have a contest for whose office is the most welcoming. And great ideas like this um, and others listed here uh, had to be dropped. So. We tried to build on our experience with the first faculty learning community we did um, to try to increase our participation. And one thing that we learned this year is that um, stipends don't necessarily improve participation. We had offered large stipends last year, um, and participation really fell off. This year, um, the participation just grew and grew and grew throughout the year. Um, no stipend, no written project, just the promise of food, and it just grew. Some of the ways that we tried to increase attendance was to really get across the message that they kind of come as you are. Whether you've attended a past session, whether or not you've completed the reading, we really want you to attend. And one of the ways that we sort of bridged that knowledge gap for people who maybe had not completed the reading um, were using short video clips or summaries to start out the session so that people felt like they could participate in the conversation even though they had not completed the reading. Another way that we um, created that bridge was through online discussions on, on Canvas. Um, so we could have asynchronous discussions um, kind of offline. Our faculty learning community included administration and staff as well. Um, there was a little bit of fear on the part of faculty that having administrators at the table might silence some voices. This is just a comical vision of, of an administrator we really like um, asleep at the meeting, but they were great participants. And we are actually looking next year to expanding to include um, more staff um, and students as well. Uh, there's a World Cafe model we're exploring um, where it's very equitable four people sit at a table, you only announce your name and, and not your status, students are included, and a question is presented to the group um, for these groups of four to discuss. Um, one of our uh, most valuable members was a staff member who had experience in multicultural efforts, so we just thought it was useful for everyone to consider maybe expanding uh, beyond faculty. Why did we focus only on race, and, and isn't that leaving out 
other groups. Um, this came from some of our reading. We, we followed the Courageous Conversations about race model. And the authors, Singleton and Linton, say here, when educators make dramatic progress toward narrowing the gaps between students of different races, they also succeed at closing all related gaps, for example, linguistic and economic gaps. So we, we worked constantly. There's a temptation when discussing a difficult topic like race to begin uh, sliding towards social class discussions. And we constantly pulled ourselves back, as the author suggested, to race and race alone. And again, Courageous Conversations here is the model that we used. And, and we like it and, and would like to extend it to more um, members of the campus. We invited only those who had been involved in some diversity efforts, and there is wider interest. One of the things that Courageous Conversations encourages is storytelling. And I do believe that was the most valuable part of it. People talk about their own experiences. We Educators try to stay sometimes in the cognitive zone. And we had to push ourselves continually to get into an emotional zone. And here we have my boss explaining um, a, an instance of prejudice in his childhood. I, I do see him differently after this experience. Again, it, it, it's helpful to be really flexible and have a flexible vision of what the whole learning community wants to do. We were flexible about not reading the entire book. We didn't have time. Oh, it, it is strange to talk about race when most of the people in the room are white, as, as is true here in Spokane. So we did find ourselves looking at white privilege as an important thing for ourselves and our students as well. You know, Peggy McIntosh here in the upper uh, right-hand corner and others on this excellent film clip that we recommend. So I think when um, people have been engaged in diversity efforts for a while, <clears throat> they start to forget what beginners aren't familiar with. So the concept that white is a race was a new one for some of the participants. Um, another was the concept of r microaggressions, um, specifically racial microaggressions. And one um, employee shared this article with us. It was addressed towards um, social services professionals primarily. Um, but as a teacher myself, I found it very applicable to um, my classroom teaching. and would really recommend that other people read that as well. Um, another thing, uh, we as a college tend to focus on um, how can we help our students of color um, to increase their success. And we don't always think about how our faculty and staff experience racial discrimination from students. So that was another sort of eye-opening moment that members of our learning community had. Kind of as a, as a kickoff, we brought Michael Benitez from University of Puget Sound. Um, and this was a memorable activity um, that he introduced to us. It was a way of teaching the difference between equality and equity. Um, so he had everyone in the room take off one of their shoes and trade that shoe with a neighbor. Um, and then the new shoe obviously was too big or too small or too narrow or too wide. So we had established equality because everyone in the room had two shoes. Um, but we didn't have equity because not everyone in the room had two shoes that fit them in a way that would allow them to walk about and do what they needed to do. Some of the participants expressed partway through an interest in hearing about, well, how do we teach about race in a classroom full of students? And one faculty member with some expertise on this um, led a seminar. And basically, the message was that meta discussion, very direct meta discussion, is important to say to the students you know, early in the quarter, maybe spend a couple of days on, how shall we talk about race in here? What do we do if this happens? What do we do if that happens? Um, what will be our response, and how can we feel safe? We did find that our learning community began to influence or, or meld with other activities on campus because a lot of the same people were involved. We were in the process of writing our diversity equity vision 2020. What do we as a college want to accomplish in order to decrease the gap in achievement between students of color and, and white students on campus? And um, 
we began focusing only on race in this diversity vision, even though, of course, later we will focus on other issues as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that it's. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I was I was sort of absorbed in just what was happening, and I was like, "Oh, it's over." <laughs> All right, okay. So, um, do we have questions for our um, for our leaders, for our presenters? And feel free to type in questions, or if you have a microphone, just go ahead and speak them. I can see that a few people are starting to type. Oh, Dawn said that she thinks she's lost her audio. Dawn, you can go ahead and type in your question. Um, so Kathy, yes, go ahead with your question. Well, people are typing. It's not really a question, but I really appreciated when you kind of looked at it from the other direction. Um, you know, how do the faculty of color feel um, for experiences that they might have, and just reminding us, you know, that there's two sides to that. So I appreciated that viewpoint. Absolutely. I have been really interested in microaggressions recently, and I, th I think that's why I was sort of like in my own little world. I was just sort of thinking about that and how courageous it is to have a space, um, you know, where people can talk about those things and really um, educate each other on the realities of, um, it, of the experiences. So Laura writes, I wish we knew more about white, middle class, unemployed, and perhaps apathetic students. Achieving the dream focuses on color, but we have more male, white students who have challenges. Do others experience this, and what do we know about this group? Great question. Um, does anybody have anything to offer about serving? Um, like, I keep thinking, I, oh, uh, Brett Burkholder at Pierce Puyallup has done a lot of work on that. Oh, thank you, Terry. Um, Terry, do you think um, do you think you could you provide like a, a quick introduction, like maybe just shoot Brett an email and CC Laura on it? Would that be uh, Laura? Um, are you in your office, Laura? Yes, she is. Okay, um, if you could, um, I'll type in my email address and maybe you could send me an email because I'm not in my office, so it's all oh, that's right. kind of complicated, so. Excellent, excellent. And it looks like Dawn has rejoined us um, just as, so hopefully her email will work. Or her voice, uh, wow, not email, um, her microphone might work now. Oh, okay, good, she can hear us again, excellent. Excellent. Other questions for um, our FLC facilitators about cooperative learning um, or interdisciplinary collaborations or about um, this focus on diversity and equity? It is all very, it is, it's all very inspiring. And it's so fun too, I, I really like the way all three presentations shared with us not just some of the content that they worked on, but shared with us some of their activities and just, and also sort of the process of being in an FLC because it can be challenging. Um, so Spokane Falls, I'm hoping that you'll maybe someday do a presentation for us on <laughs> how to facilitate um, a learning community because I think the the cool thing about that you guys have done here too is you are sort of um, giving permission for it to be a process, which I really like a lot. Yeah, thank you, Barb. That would be great. Other questions or 
comments for our FLC facilitators or FLC participants? Yes, Laura wrote, you had great tips on how to harness motivation in FLCs, and Jerry says I'm feeling guilty about retiring. <laughs> I know, it's exciting to hear about other people's good work. You know, you're like, oh, um, what, could, what could my role be like? Absolutely. Um, oh, she says, I'm not retiring from the interpreting program, though. No, that's good. That's good. We, we don't want to lose you. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We have a few more, just a few more slides um, here at the end. So if you're interested in more resources about faculty learning communities, I have a few resources um, for you. And um, here is my contact information and Alyssa's contact information if you want to get in touch with us. And I actually, Alyssa was very kind by saying that I've been updating the blog, but I haven't, I haven't been as, I haven't updated um, the blog with the slide decks and the most recent recordings. And so that is definitely one of my projects, um, trying to just get all of this great information up so other people can access it. And finally, we have this, um, we have a survey here um, from SurveyMonkey, and if you wouldn't mind if you're watching this or um, if you participated today, if you wouldn't mind um, just taking a few minutes to fill out a very brief survey, that would be great. And I'm just looking to see where my, um, I just need to, I'm on it, Jen. I got it. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. I forgot to cut and paste that. Thank you. No worries. So to make sure my gonna, typing's right. Yeah. Yeah. So Alyssa's going to type this into the. Oh yeah. I guess I could have just typed it right. Serving my key not too hard. Okay. I think I typed it correctly this time. Perfect. For you all. So unless there are more questions, I will release you all to return to your stacks of papers and grading. <laughs> it's that time of the quarter. Thank you so much for making the time to join us today. Thank Thanks, you, Laura. Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you to our present presenters. Thank you, Joan. Joan, did you have one more thing to say? No, I just said thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes, and no great problem. job, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for a great year. I can't believe it's over, Jen. I know. I can't either. <laughs> <laughs>